millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. But Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. There is nothing I love more than an amazing meal with high quality meat cooked at home because let's be honest, eating out is so expensive. And you also know that eating out is the number one budget buster. That is why I am so glad I found ButcherBox. ButcherBox is a premium meat subscription service dedicated to delivering high quality, grass fed, and grass finished beef, organic chicken, pork raised crate free, and wild caught seafood directly to your doorstep with free shipping always. You even get exclusive member deals, recipes, and a variety of high quality cuts at an amazing price. New users will receive their choice of two pounds of ground beef, three pounds of chicken thighs, or one pound of premium steak tips for a year. Use code ETM and get $20 off your first box at ButcherBox.com. Last night, we made a beef stew with meat from ButcherBox, and you can taste the difference. It was so satisfying and delicious, and all of our friends that were over for a dinner party, they raved at how good it was. So do yourself a favor and eat better this year with the best meat and seafood on the planet delivered to your door. ButcherBox is offering my listeners their choice of a weeknight meal essential, three pounds of chicken thighs, two pounds of ground beef, or one pound of premium steak tips for free in every order for a year. Plus, get $20 off your first order. Sign up today at butcherbox.com etm. And use code ETM to choose your free offer and get $20 off. In order to fix the problem, you have to understand why you have the debt in the first place. So do do you have the debt because um, you lost your job. Was there a COVID issue, a medical issue? Was there a, a overspending issue? And, and overspending happens and you can't beat yourself up because you overspent. You know, you made a mistake. There's ways to fix it. Hey, welcome back to Everyone's Talking Money. I am your host, Shauna Game. It's so good to have you here. This show is all about helping you do money from a place of ease, letting go of all of that negative self-talk around money and frustration about not being able to achieve your goals so you can finally stress less and live more. All right, in this episode, we need to have a conversation about debt. There is a lot of shame and fear around debt, and most of it is stirred up by money experts who want you to believe that you are not good enough unless you are debt free. I'm asking, please, can we cut the crap and just be honest about debt? We all have it or had it or will have it, and it does not reflect who you are or your skills with money. Life happens. You go to school, you take on debt, you had a leak in your roof, and you need to put the repairs on a credit card. You went shopping to feel good about yourself and you went into debt. It is not a crime. Leslie Tain, our guest in this episode, she is a leading New York financial attorney and founder and managing director of Tain Law Group. She says that debt is never a death sentence, contrary to what some people will have you believe. In this episode, it is going to blow your mind. We will talk about everything you need to reframe, pay off, and create healthy habits around debt. Leslie and I talk about what your rights are regarding debt collectors, what debt negotiation and settlement options exist, and how certain life changes like losing a loved one or divorce affect debt. Think of this as your masterclass in debt, and this conversation will load you up with useful tips and just leave you feeling so much better about debt in general. All right, let's start talking. You know, the personal finance world has a lot to say about debt. It's it's good, it's bad. Uh, there's a lot of people that just talk about debt over and over and over again. But I know there are also a lot of people out there that have trouble even making the minimum monthly payments. And a lot of people just feel tremendous amounts of shame because a debt went to collection or their credit score went down or the fact that they even have debt. And you're this expert. I was so excited to have you on because you help consumers really understand their rights when it comes to debt and help them reshape 
these these feelings of shame around debt. And we're going to really dive into this. But just to start us off, why do you think we've created this society, Leslie, where we shame people for having debt? Like this is this is the worst thing ever. So I think that the historically debt was never really talked about. And because people really didn't talk about debt on a regular basis, you know, there, there is some secrecy about it. And I think that that's where initially that, that shame comes from. It's not really a topic of conversation that most families have on a regular basis. It's usually hidden, you know, it, and it's something that pops up and, and then people, uh, you have these expressions of, oh, wow, really? So it makes people then react with the, with either fear or apprehension and certainly with embarrassment or shame. So it's very, very common. And then there's this whole shroud of, uh, and this umbrella of, well, you, you're a good person if you pay your bills and you have good credit. So one thing obviously has nothing to do with the other. Life has right. different circumstances, but I think that's where there's been a lot of marketing of the credit score and the importance of being having this wonderful credit score. So if you do something to negatively impact it, it all of a sudden turns out, turns into people feeling that, oh, I must not be a good person because I didn't do what I was supposed to do. Yeah. I'm so glad you brought this up because there's this air of perfectionism when it comes to money. And there's, you know, you're either on one side of the camp where, yeah, you have great credit score, you don't have any debt, you've done everything right, you've checked all the boxes, whatever that means. And then people are on the other side of, of that box, you know, and, and so I think it's really interesting because we already feel a lot of really strong emotions around money. And then when we enter into the conversation around debt, it's just, I think for a lot of people, it feels, amplified almost to the point where like they can't they can't stand it they can't handle it no doubt i mean it, my, in my experience of, of dealing with clients with debt for uh, over 25 years at this point the it's a consistent it's a consistent line of feeling of they haven't done the right thing you know they're not a good person you know they feel shameful embarrassed they don't want to tell their loved ones or significant others you know it, you know you know maybe they 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 had an expectation of themselves and that didn't work out. And, and so there's just so many, there's so many lines that come into the middle of that, or I should say like debt as a beating heart, you know, has so many veins and arteries and things that um, are impacted by debt as an overall, you know, um, central, if you, you know, again, just for visualization purposes, you know, if you look at it as like the, the central part of somebody's life, you know, from debt comes credit, the ability to borrow, to buy a house and cars and have money and pay your bills and have appropriate cash flow. So, for, you know, that if you look at it or you think about it in your head, that debt is like the center of, of almost everything that happens in our lives financially in the United States. I think that's where it, it's just so central to uh, existence in, in the American way of life. So we're going to we're gonna talk about this in a different framework, which I'm really excited about because you say that debt should never be a death sentence and that there's always a solution. And we're going to dig into this a bit. But for starters, can you break down, this may seem really overly simplistic, but I, I think it's important to start here. What debt is? Like, is it a specific amount of money or simply an amount of money that you owe more than what you have? Like, what actually defines debt? So, debt is very broadly defined as uh, money that you owe to somebody else. That's debt. Now, it could be good debt or bad debt, and there's all different kinds of categories and, and ways to characterize it. But sim simply put, it's just money that you owe to somebody else. That's a debt. And is there a common form of debt that you see most people have? Is it credit card debt, student loan debt, or is it really just a, a mixture of all different types of debt? So from an unsecured debt perspective, and the difference being obviously a secured debt is something that the bank or the creditor who loaned the money can take back in the event of default or non-payment, like a house or car, ATV, things like that. Um, in the un unsecured world where there isn't something tangible for the creditor who lent the money to remove, we see um, credit card debt and student loans as being the number one um, type of debt that people have. And, and I'm going to say most commonly is probably credit card debt. Yeah, I know. The, n the numbers around credit card debt is, is, is staggering. <laughs> uh, staggering and growing. Um, staggering and growing. Yes, very important. So let's go back to this never being a death sentence. 
what can we do if if we can't manage the debt or we're not making progress or you know we just can't get this debt paid off what are what are some of our options so there's lots of different options depending on what your goals are and strategies and and ultimately what your lifestyle is and want and what you want it to be so and again, it, it comes down to looking at the type of debt that you have. If you have student loan debt, the type of student loan debt, you know, you have to really break it down. If you have credit card debt, how many do you have? What are you using the credit cards for? Are you supplementing your income and that's why you have credit card debt? Or do you use it and you, you know, you buy large items and then you pay them off? Everybody has a different, and there's no two situations that are identical. Even if people have the same type of debt, the reality is that in order to fix the problem, you have to understand why you have the debt in the first place. So do do you have the debt because um, you lost your job? Was there a COVID issue, a medical issue? Was there a a overspending issue? And and overspending happens and you can't beat yourself up because you overspent. You you made a mistake. There's ways to fix it. Do you have student loan debt? You know, are you managing the student loan debt appropriately? One of the challenges in student loan debt alone is the mismanagement of the student loans, is the perpetuation of forbearance and deferment of those loans, which builds the balances and ultimately makes it more challenging to pay off. So, you know, again, when we talk to clients and we're looking at strategizing about the debt, it's it's overwhelming because most people don't understand what options they do have. So in order to know what options you have, you have to speak to somebody who really understands debt. And there's people out there that say they understand it. There's, you know, people who've done it themselves and then claim they're experts. And then, right. you know, you really have to talk to somebody who understands debt inside and out. What does that debt mean to you? And then how can it be resolved? Because different types of debt resolve differently. Student loans and credit cards resolve very differently than mortgage debt, merchant cash advance debt, business debt, loans, personal lines of credit. All of those things have different processes and procedures. And even within that, you know, if we could break it down into into small, but it's it's not necessary to do so now. But, you know, with credit card debt, when we look at it, there's different creditors. Each bank has a different way of resolving the debt between the way Chase does it and Citibank does it and Capital One all do different things. Um, So, you know, and there's 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 dozens of banks that lend money. So, again, it's not a death sentence, but it feels like a what I would call like a hard stop. Because boom, you hit a wall. You're not getting anywhere. You're not paying it down. You don't see a break. You continue to use the debt. You're out of available credit. You know, and then boom, that's the wall that you hit. And you're like, what do I do now? So again, the solutions, there are solutions and we can run through different types of solutions, but you know, they're and they're very successful solutions, again, depending on your strategies and the type of debt that you have. Well, let's just run through because credit card debt is something that I think a lot of us can relate to and and certainly something that with interest rates go, you know on the rise and it just feels all consuming. So what are what are some of our options if we're in credit card debt? So if you're in credit card debt and you're having difficulty repaying, your first first look is really about your budget. You know, what are you paying? How much are you paying? Are you paying back the minimum every month? Are you barely making the minimum? Do you have the cash flow? What does your future look like? And with future, I mean the next three months, six months, year in terms of cash flow. How are you going to be able to pay this? And what is your budget? First question, we ask a client, have you given any consideration to a budget? What do you have available each month to pay towards this? That's the starting point. Without that, you know, it's a, it's a difficult um process. But here, here's the rundown of the options. There's, um, I'll name them and then we can talk about each one of them. The, there's debt settlement, there's bankruptcy, there's debt consolidation, which is different than debt settlement. There's consumer credit counseling, and there's going directly to the creditor yourself. So if we start with going directly to the creditor, because that's the first stop, the easiest one, talk to the creditor. Maybe your bill pays are off. So maybe the cash flow issue is that you have all your bills due on the 15th of the month. Call the creditor, the bank, and ask them if they're willing to move the credit card payment date to the end of the month when you have more cash flow so that you don't have an issue getting a, a jam in the middle of the month when your rent or mortgage is due and your car payment exactly, and everything yeah. like that. The bank will actually move the payment. A lot of people don't know that. Other options through the bank directly are you could say, if let's say you have great credit, good history, the interest rate is high, but you always pay your bill. But you're having trouble because the interest rate is high. So now the minimum payment is high and you're not seeing a a balance reduction. Ask the bank. 
am I eligible for an interest rate reduction? My credit is good. And they can do it. They'll do a check right on the phone with you. And they can determine if there's an opportunity to lower the interest and see if that helps. If that doesn't help, you can ask for other products. Very often there's products available to you that you'd not even know that they're out there unless you speak to the bank. And the bank can say, you know what? We have a product that might work. We have a different credit card that might have a 0% interest. We can move you into that. Again, you have to advocate for yourself and ask the questions. The challenge for most consumers is that they don't know the questions to ask. And so, and that's understandable. So again, if you're listening to this and you're saying, oh, this is like, why didn't I do that? Why didn't I think of that? You're not expected to think of that. That's where you have an expert who comes in (laughs) to ask the questions and, and understands what's available. So, and that's the same with student loans. So you should call the servicer first and have a conversation about what options are available to you that might work better in your budget. Now, if you've exhausted that and it's still not working and you're starting to go behind, none of those options are going to be available if you go behind because now it's going to start hitting your credit. And, and once you have uh, a credit, a missed payment, and it lowers, starts to lower your credit score, you're going to be in a high risk category. So it's unlikely you're going to get any type of um, option or program from the creditor themselves. That's not a suspension of your credit, of your available usage of the card. So once you go behind, they'll, they'll put you in a repayment a structured repayment on the full balance, um, but they'll suspend your card privileges. And so uh, that may or may not be productive for you. So if that's the case, uh, then and that works for you, that's one option. Next, you move down the line to what's the difference between debt settlement and debt consolidation? Debt consolidation is kind of a broad term of of, of ways in which to restructure debt. You can do it through a loan, through debt settlement. You can, the same thing, debt consolidation is just calling the creditor and talking it through or finding different ways. So there's a couple of things that fall under that umbrella. Debt settlement is one of them. Debt settlement can be one of the most successful processes in getting out of debt if it's done right. But because it preys on consumers, unfortunately, yes. there's lots of unscrupulous businesses that are out there that prey on consumers and say they'll help you. They'll make promises and guarantees, but they'll take your money and run. So that's made the consumer interest in debt settlement you know, variable. Some people are afraid of it because of what's gone on. Other people you know, search it out. And they still go with debt settlement companies that make promises to them because you're very emotional at that point. Once you're once you've crossed the line into emotions, you can't make good financial decisions. And you really should be with somebody who cares about you and advocates for you. And only somebody who has skin in the game is going to do that like an attorney. Debt settlement does, does, has no skin in the game. Their number one goal is to sell you and get you in and then, you know, provide you a service, but the number one goal is to to get you in as a client. When you're working with an attorney for debt settlement purposes, totally different ball game. There's a different ethical obligation a different uh, accountability, a a different liability. And if there's a challenge, there's there's some place to go um, and some comfort. And that's why people use come to me. It's not, I'm not is saying expensive? that all debt settlement is bad under any circumstance. And I started out saying debt settlement can be extremely successful if it's done right. But as a consumer, you really have to do your research. Don't be sold because you just spoke to somebody who's a great salesperson, because most of it are sales pitches. You have to know your budget, what you're looking to accomplish. Who is this company? Where have they been? Who are you talking to? You know, do they outsource it? Are you talking to a call center? You know, again, the consumer doesn't know the questions to ask, which is why I love doing these podcasts because I love informing the consumer of what you should do to advocate for yourself. But so debt settlement is one solution and it's a good solution, but I, but be sure you know your budget and who you're dealing with and working with. It doesn't matter that they're on television. It doesn't matter that they advertise. That doesn't make them legitimate. What's legitimate is that you've done your research and you're sure you're comfortable with the solutions they're offering you and you've asked all the questions you need to to move forward. What are the general costs of, of like working with an attorney to to help you through this process? Is it something that, you know, most people can afford if they're in a, a debt situation? Totally affordable. Absolutely affordable. It's It should be built into your payment, into the budgeted payment for the whole resolution process. So it shouldn't be something that you don't know. It shouldn't be something that's necessarily, you know, incentive based. Um, and it shouldn't be something that you have to pay up front. 
And in many states, it's outlawed. And in many states, um, it's illegal to charge money up front. And New York is one of those states that doesn't allow that. And you have to be licensed by the Department of Finance. And again, most consumers don't know that and they don't ask that question. Is the company that you're working for appropriately licensed? In terms of fees, because there's a licensing requirements, there's fee structure requirements that has to be disclosed. I just had a client call me today and said, tell me that there was a debt settlement company and they want to transition over and they can't tell me what the fees are. So you should know what the fees are ahead of time. You should be able to repeat back exactly what you're doing. It does not cost more to work with an attorney. In fact, you know, it's, it's the old adage, penny wise, pound foolish. In some cases, you get what you pay for. With an attorney, you're going to get legal advice. In, in many cases, tax direction and advice, uh, an understanding of the credit and debt structures, and, an under, and a full and complete understanding of what you're up against and what you're facing and disclosure. The attorneys are required to disclose information to you more so than just some company that's out there. And, and if it's not disclosed, the attorney can be um, reprimanded, sanctioned, disbarred. So again, it, even if you look at number to number, dollar to dollar, and in my experience, there's no more money uh, working certainly with my firm than it is with, with these other companies because the other companies structure it around this. You know, it's a, it's a working model and um, it sounds very similar um, but again, I think people are afraid of attorneys, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, and I understand that many people have had bad experiences with attorneys, but you know, I, I try to, I try not to be so scary. Um, <laughs> although my, between my New York accent, my lawyer like personality and my area of practice, like it's just, it's just not a soft look. <laughs> But it's, but my clients like that. They like the advocacy part. The you know I'm ambitious about it. I'm zealous for my for my clients. Um, you know, and I really will hold their hand and be there as much as I can. Um, and, and you know, obviously, the client has to have realistic expectations of, of that. But it shouldn't cost more. So you know, there's no hourly billing certainly on our end. Um, this way, there's an open door policy. I think when there's hourly billing, the client feels. Uh, deterred from calling in. And, you know, that occurs in, ma in many matrimonial cases, of course, and so, and, and other types of legal practices. So I don't want my clients deterred from calling me because otherwise it's just not going to work. I need to know what's going on. I don't want somebody to feel uncomfortable about calling me. And again, one of the differences between law firms and non-law firms in that settlement arena is that if you want to talk to that attorney, that attorney's got to talk to you. So you either hear from them. And I have heard, again, in, in this realm, I, you know, I've been doing this such a long time. So you get a lot of feedback from people. And I have heard other people say, you know, I call, I was working with an attorney. It wasn't really their practice area, but they said they do me a favor. You do not want to pay for a learning curve. That, that, that attorney is going to learn off of you. And yes, at some point they might be able to get a resolve, but unless you really, they really understand this, like, Somebody said to me their disability attorney was going to call. I said, I wouldn't, I mean, I understand disability law, but I'm not going to take on a client doing disability work because it's not my area of practice. So it's the same thing in, in the debt world. There are so many nuances in the debt settlement arena uh, that um, it's not, it's not the one-off. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be a one-off. It'll be a difficult battle. Um, it, it, it probably won't end in the most successful results. And what you're looking for ultimately, again, as the consumer and advocating for yourself is you're looking for the results. That's why I mentioned what's your goal in the beginning is your goal to reduce your cash outlay, to get out of debt quickly, uh, to manage all aspects of it. Understanding your goals and your budget, it goes hand in hand to understanding, you know, is Leslie Tain the right lawyer to help you get out of debt? And sometimes we're not. Sometimes it's not a good fit. Sometimes we're, sometimes, you know, it's a relationship. Sometimes it's not going to work. And, and that happens where we have a situation where we know that it's just not going to be a successful relationship for one reason or another. And we, you know, have to turn people away. And, and so you're managing those expectations on your end as a consumer is important. You know, what am I looking to get out of this? Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news... 
Well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic. And it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps. But I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. Gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash ETM. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built-in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash etm. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash etm for your extended 30-day free trial. When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. (laughs) I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. NerdWallet. Finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. Financial anxiety, anyone? Yeah, you're not alone. But worrying about it, it doesn't help. Earnin does. Earnin is an app that gives you access to your pay as you work up to $100 per day or up to $750 per pay period. You just download the Earnin app and verify your paycheck. Then you can access up to $100 per day as you work and leave an additional tip. Any money you access plus tips are automatically repaid from your next paycheck. So, how would you spend the money you get from Earnin? Well, Honestly, my hubby and I have been feeling a little bit disconnected lately. That's what happens after you've been together about 12 years. So I would spend the money on a special date night with dinner and maybe bowling, you know, to bring back some of that giggly excitement that we both felt at the beginning. Make Earnin a part of your financial routine and join Earnin's over three and a half million customers who say things like, when I think about Earnin, I think about financial stability, security, gives me a lot of peace of mind. Download Earnin today, spelled E-A-R-N-I-N, in the Google Play or Apple App Store. When you download the Earnin app, type in Talkin, T-A-L-K-A-N, money under podcast when you sign up. It will really help the show. Talkin money under podcast. Subject to your available earnings, location, daily max, and pay period max. See earnin.com slash T-O-S for details. Earnin is a financial technology company, not a bank. Bank products are issued by Evolve Bank and Trust, member FDIC. Talk to me a little bit about when something goes to collection. You know, I I recently received a letter from a collection for something I'd paid and, you know, I immediately like broke out in a a, a sweat and I, I was like, I have my documentation. I paid this. But but just the idea of collections, I know for a lot of people is really, really scary. So what are your options if something does go to collections? Do you have any any uh, you know way to to settle that? So I liken that experience to like you get pulled over by the police and you like your heart drops cuz you're like, "Oh my god, I got pulled over." And if you get a collection letter, it's the same feeling. And I and I get that. So there are tons of ways to settle debt. You know, again, it depends on the type of debt. 
that we're talking about and uh, and understanding what's gone on. The challenge that consumers have is that um, they often think they could do it themselves and they call the credit and they just, you know, vomit up every single thing that's gone on in the last five years of their life. And they give them all this information, which is just completely unnecessary. And then the creditor, the collector, who's very experienced, turns around and says, okay, thanks for the information. Now you can pay the full balance because now you've told me everything. So, you know, it's, it's a, it's, it's a, it's doable, but it's, it's possible to get your hands very dirty. So, and, and maybe not get the best possible outcome. And, and I have seen that scenario many times where somebody says, you know, I called the creditor, I wasn't able to get anywhere. And so, so what did you tell them? Because sometimes what you tell them, and there's a reason why you didn't get anywhere, is because what you disclose to them. So the short answer to the question is yes. You get a collection letter, absolutely. If you paid it and you have proof that you paid it, and this is the caveat, and the is that anytime you pay a debt, you have to keep files. Either scan them in, take pictures of them, keep paper files, but you have to keep files for at least seven years. Um, and you should get into the habit of a uh, good financial habit of keeping all your financial documents in one place. So you know where they are in case something like this happens, because mistakes can be made where something was paid and it got through and you just have to show that it was paid. Most often happens in the medical billing environment where there's right. tons right. of errors in the medical billing world and you'll get an, uh, um, um, a collection letter related to medical billing. So again, you know, and, and it's overwhelming at times because there's a lot coming in and out, but keep a file, one called medical bills, one called debt payments, whatever it is. And if you close your bank accounts, you move around, don't destroy the documents because you won't be able to get the statements. You want to hold on to these things. So the short answer is yes, the debt can be settled. Can you do it yourself? Possibly. Um, and again, it depends on the debt. You know, if you're talking about a debt from an attorney's office and that's the collection letter you got, I would recommend reaching out to an attorney before you call the creditor. Um, if it's a small debt collection, you paid it off. Absolutely. Send them and let them know. If it's a small medical bill, uh, a, you know, um, a utility bill, something like that, then call the creditor. Medical bills, utility bills, super easy to work through. Um, they'll, they'll put you on small payment plans. They just want to be paid. So call them up, work through it yourself. But as soon as you're getting into credit card debt, large numbers, um, loans, things like that, you should speak to an attorney. So let's go back a little bit to student loan payments because those are starting again. And I know that people are worried about, you know, after all these years having to make those payments again. And I know that student loan debt is very difficult to get rid of uh, purposefully. And so I think people feel really lost and confused when it comes to student loan debt. So you mentioned, you know, call your serv servicer talk to them uh, about your situation, but is there anything that you should ask them or tell them or look for, or, or what are the options if you, if you just can't make the student loan payment? So here's the deal on student loans. There's two types. There's federal loans and private loans. Um, the, the federal loans were in forbearance and uh, for through the CARES Act, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, and the repayments just started beginning October 1st. So if you, you should have received a notice from your servicer stating that your loan payments are um, be, are time to do, that, that will come by email and or mail. And if you haven't gotten it, and I can tell you my own children, I asked them the same question. Did you get a notice from the federal government? Huh? I said, <laughs> oh, I don't use that email anymore. I said, well, go back and look at the email. So um, if you have an old email that you don't use anymore because you outgrew it, like my own children said they did, <laughs> you have to go back and look and make sure that you have it. You need to know the type of debt that you have in order to resolve it. Like, is it federal student loans or private student loans? They go in completely different directions. The private student loans, very little options. You can't pay it. It's probable that you're going to get sued. And, and they will sue you. They will garnish your wages, freeze your bank accounts, put liens against your property. They will come after you. Federal is a different story. They're totally a little bit more, they're much more, much easier to do so. But I do want to make a comment on the design of federal student loans. All student loans are designed, designed purposefully, as you said, for long-term payments, 20 to 30 year repayments. None of that should be expected to be paid off in the first few years. It is, it is just like a mortgage. It has a, a schedule of payments 
and the schedule of payments early on are mostly interest and then it then it escalates and more principal gets paid over time. So it is a long-term loan, not short-term. And I think the challenge that people don't realize is that why do I still have this 10 years later after I graduated? Well, that's because it's designed that way. It's designed to give you the most money to go through an education and to pay it back over a long period of time with the idea that your career changes over time and your income level increases, giving you the ability to pay it. So if you have a federal student loan and you're challenged paying it, you have to you have to have your tax returns and you have to have your um, budget. They already know your tax return. It's the federal government. They know what you filed and didn't file. So you, you can't hide that. But you they will give you a payment schedule. If you have a challenge with the payment schedule, the dollar amount that they gave you, and the explanation, and it comes with an explanation. So it says your payment is $72 a month, and this is why it's $72 a month. If you can't pay that, whatever the number is, you have to call the servicer and have a conversation. What programs are available for me? I can tell you that you can't just go in and be like, I can't pay it because I have three children and I send them to camp and I have to pay for this. And, oh, and because I have children, I can't work and I work part time and I, and I can't find a job. That doesn't fly. So you have to figure out a way, you know, you have to show them what your income is and you, you know, a repay, some sort of repayment schedule. The repayment schedule could be zero, but understand mm-hmm. if you go to a zero repayment schedule, that interest is still accumulating on your principal balance which means as interest becomes principal, the principal then has is a higher balance and therefore the interest is on a higher balance every time they compound or place on top of the interest money. So if there's $200 of interest and that gets placed on your balance of $1,000 and now you have, I'm making up the numbers because that, that wouldn't make sense, but $1,200 in interest, $1,200 including interest and principal, now you're getting interest on 1200. So next time you get another interest on it, you're going to be the balance is higher. So every, it's called compounding the interest. It's layering on. So every time you defer and do not pay, your balances are going to go up. And if you want to defer for years, in many cases, you can, you can defer for years and years and years based on income, but eventually it, the, the balances are going to grow exponentially and the federal government can garnish your social security and they can take any of your tax refund money. So if you are ever going to get tax refund money, they can take that and they can garnish your social security, which most creditors cannot. So at some mm. point they will catch up with you. It's always my recommendation on federal student loans or any student loans to pay down the balances. And I'm going to tell you another reason why from personal experience. If you don't pay down the balances and every year the balance on your federal student loan grows and doesn't decrease, you run the risk of not getting homeowner's insurance, you run the risk of not having certain licenses renewed or and or not getting approved for any kind of loan. And I have absolutely seen that happen. So uh, I had somebody receive a notice from their homeowner's insurance company denying homeowner's insurance because their federal student loan balance did not go down over the last year. Now, you might say there was no requirement for the federal student loan balance to go down because it was in deferment. The insurance company doesn't care. Denied. So if you think that it won't catch up with you and you're relatively young, then it's a mistake. It's an absolute fatal mistake. And it's also, in my opinion, a fatal mistake to wait around for um, forgiveness. So I get that all the time. Maybe I should wait. So if I waited, because they've been talking forgiveness for years, I would have my own federal student loan still. (laughs) And it just, like I've been saying all along, and I've been consistent with my commentary on this, that they will forgive uh, certain categories, certain disabled people, veterans, um, and certain categories of people will get federal student loan forgiveness and relief. The, The person who went to NYU for 80 grand and then decided that they're going to work for 30 grand a year and doesn't want to pay back their loans or really can't pay back their loans is not going to be in that category. It just is, it's just, and I'm not saying that as a, as being harsh, I'm saying it because I've been following this and and dealing with this for clients for years and years and years on end. It is unlikely. And that is not the pattern. The uh, federal student loan program uh, forgiveness by the Biden administration was struck down by the Supreme Court because he tried to find a loophole and get the student loans forgiven under the um, exec- under an executive act 
and it was struck down. So if he couldn't do it under those circumstances, the chance of getting federal student loans forgiven is a general broad sweep is unlikely. Remember, those are federal programs. How do we fund federal programs? Taxpayers. So if you're going to eliminate a federal program that is income generating, then somebody has to make up the shortfall and that shortfall will, will follow down to taxpayers. So eventually you as a taxpayer will have, it, will have to fund these programs because they're never going to eliminate the programs. So again, I only say this because many people still ask me, should I not pay and wait for a forgiveness program? You should try to get your student loans into repayment I understand the challenges right now, and there is an onboarding um, time frame that the administration has given over the next year for federal student loans. It's a one-year, what they call, ramp process. They're not going to go um, put anything into collections. So you have you have some time, mm -hmm. but don't yeah. ignore it, and you should reach out now and, and don't let it fall into collections. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com slash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. So something else I wanted to, to ask you about, you know, I went through a divorce about 12 years ago, and I actually had to take on a lot of debt and was depleted pretty much all of my assets. In the process, it was not a, a fun experience. It was emotionally, financially draining. A lot of people have, have a similar experience. And then my credit took a nosedive because of something my ex-husband did. <laughs> And it just was, even as a money expert myself, it was a quite a situation that's taken many, many years to uh, work through. So I'm wondering, you know, how do life changes like divorce or, you know, somebody passing away, how do those impact our debt situation and, and what, like, what should we know about? So I completely understand the divorce situation. I, I, I completely do. I was divorced and I totally understand the challenges financially and emotionally that you go through. It's probably one of the worst experiences of, of anybody's life. And um, it's probably the lowest in terms of the financial piece of the puzzle, trying to unravel um, what is a connection with another person financially is very difficult. Getting divorced is the, really the easy part. The hard part is unraveling the financial connection. So, and disconnecting maybe from somebody who didn't do the right thing, who wasn't maybe honest right. and who ran up debt and, and, you know, you, you know, getting out of that. And then obviously, depending on where you live, the laws of your state can make you responsible as, as you experience for marital debt that gets incurred during the marriage, even though it's not technically your fault. So I, I, I'm very sympathetic to that. And, um, I have lots of clients that go through those experiences and the same thing, Death is a little bit different uh, because sometimes, in many cases, it's very sudden and uh, there's no preparation um, on the death side of things. But there are things you could do both in, in those scenarios and life altering scenarios um, to protect yourself. One, always be aware of your finances. Always be in the know. Just because one person pays the bills, don't stick your head in the sand and say, my spouse pays the bills or my significant other pays the bills. There's no rush to combine finances ever. I'm not an advocate of that in, in many, many circumstances of combining finances, uh, combining bank accounts. You have to do what works best for you and your significant other. And, um, you know, uh, it makes it, it does make it easier to unwind that, especially if you're not married, uh, where you won't necessarily have the law on your side um, or, or assistance through the legal help. Um, so, and that happens the same thing with, with death as well. You know, by combining certain debts, you become responsible if something happens to the other individual. And it could be a spouse or a significant other because there's no requirement that joint credit cards are in spouse's name. So if somebody dies, that debt theoretically could die with them. If they, if it's a joint account, the survivor will be responsible for that. Um, in mortgage debt, things like that, it's a little bit different uh, because you, you don't necessarily, the debt's not going to die. There's a security interest, obviously, the property. But 
in divorce situations, I see some of the absolute messiest, messiest financial uh, <laughs> yes. circumstances in divorce. I know, I know, it, it's so messy and dirty, um, and everybody's so angry. And I and I yeah. very d- much deal with that. Where I have two spouses that I can't even be in the same conference room, or soon to be ex spouses, and. Um, so I get it and I get the anger and frustration, but we got to get to the bottom line. And the bottom line is trying to get it resolved and unwinding. If you're going to get divorced before you get divorced, or you're thinking about that, do not combine bank accounts and, and take out credit cards. You, you need to know what's in your name. Are ca- joint cars and cars and joint names? Are the bank accounts in joint names? Who has access to what money? Where is that money? You know, because I have seen spouses take money. Take money, take jewelry, take uh, build. You know, if there's no order, if you're getting divorced, there should be in some states a court order um, that says that the, that you can't do anything so that each spouse is bound by what's there currently. Because if there's no court order, you know, theoretically, you can still go ahead and use your spouse's Social Security number, uh, especially if you have power of attorney. So if you have a power of attorney and you're getting divorced and it's not it's, it's not something that you want your significant other to have. You need to revoke your power of attorney uh, and you need to have access to the credit cards and bank accounts because one spouse could cut you off easily. Um, and so unless you know what's happening, make sure you have all the statements. You have a list of everything. How is it being paid? Where is it being paid? Who's responsible for it? Are you a joint card holder or an authorized user? Big difference between the two. Who's going to be responsible for the debt? What's on those cards? What did you accumulate? And I know that I rattle this off and your head is probably spinning, but these are things that when you're, that's why getting divorced is, is very, very challenging um, because there's so many things to unwind. In death, the challenges, the, the overwhelming experience of the death experience is challenging. Do your surviving family a favor and have everything written out. You should have a will. You, they're not expensive to get. Don't write one on a napkin. Go see an attorney who can put that together. You have bills that have to be paid. They should know where they are. There should be a file with all your um, with all your passcodes in it, all your statements in it. That you know, put it in a lockbox. Somebody's got to have the combination to it. I mean, we saw so much of this during COVID because there was so much sudden death yeah, during COVID, yeah. and then you have surviving family members saying, "I I, I don't know. I, I don't know who. Where's the mortgage? I don't know where the life insurance policy is. I don't know how to pay the bills. Am I responsible for my?" spouse. You know, I never paid a bill. I don't know if I'm responsible for the debt. What do I do? Who do I contact? You know, all of that really is a life. um, It's a life conversation. You know, death and illness can happen. Um, Accidents can happen. And Mm. to be prepared to pay the bills under those circumstances. And let's say you lose your significant other and you are distraught. You're not in any any mental time. any mental capacity to pay bills at that time. You need somebody to help you. If you have an attorney that does your will, they will help you through these processes. Again, another reason why it doesn't matter that you don't have any money or or significant assets, put something together so everybody knows where it belongs. And again, with that, family members will pop up here and there upon death and other things happening. You just (laughs) want if you love your family, do them a favor because <laughs> when you're gone and unable to under, you know, explain where everything is, how are they going to find your files and yeah. your, your passcodes to your phone, to your bank accounts? And that doesn't mean putting everybody on your bank accounts because that's a mistake at times. All you need is a valid power of attorney, which can be done by an attorney, not on your own, not because you downloaded a form from some site. Those are, that's, you know what that is? That's um, for most attorneys, that's job security because they're never done right. right. So, and then the person is dead and then you can't get another signature. So never do that. An attorney who knows how to put these things together because it putting somebody's name on a bank account could be a fatal financial error. You can have an adult child with debt. They get sued, get a judgment. Their parents' bank account gets locked up because their name is on it. So you want to be very careful about putting people's names on your bank account for estate planning purposes. But again, death and divorce are very challenging times and can cause tremendous financial insecurity and tremendous amounts of debt. You can get out of them. Um, and I, I, under the divorce situation, and I have a lot of matrimonial attorneys that refer business to me, I can work with both, the, the, both spouses 
on that, where in, in matrimonial cases, they can't. But in, in these cases, I can work with both spouses and I do, and I can you know, manage getting them through it and keeping it in line with the, with the divorce agreement and pulling the issues out, the financial issues out of the divorce will make your divorce a lot cheaper. Because one of the things I, I know that you know, and that anybody who's gone through divorce knows is that divorce is very expensive. Thousands yes. and thousands and thousands and sometimes tens of thousands of dollars to get divorced. If you can limit the exposure by getting your debt resolved through somebody, you will limit your exposure to additional legal bills and more debt because a lot of people put them their legal fees on credit cards. Right, right. Well, it's clear that you are very passionate about this. I love this. This is why we all need a lawyer for for this stuff. And I just want to end maybe just a, a, a quick you know, word of wisdom or ray of sunshine. We've been talking about some, some heavy stuff here uh, during this conversation, but I want to go back to this, you know, it's not a death sentence, you know, in this idea of shame and embarrassment that we all kind of have, you know, that, that are in this situation where we have debt that's unmanageable. Give us, you know, just a quick, you know, little word of wisdom or, or pep talk to kind of end this so that we, we feel like we can do this. I am super passionate about debt. I can fix any debt problem. <laughs> so I, I only look at things as the glass is half full. And yes, we deal with a lot of challenges, but debt is by, uh, debt is by far not a death sentence. Debt is part of life. When you, when you make it part of your life, you can, you can manage it and it can work for you. So don't, don't look at it as the, um, you know, as a negative, it's a positive embrace debt be excited to pay your bills, be excited to do your budget. And just if you, as soon as you look at things a little bit differently with a different perspective and different glasses, you will, you'll change your whole relationship with debt. And debt has a very negative sound to it, but uh, again, it can, it can be really turned around and um, used to your advantage. So uh, don't be, don't be in despair because you have debt. Everybody has debt in one way or another. It's the question of what you do with it that matters. I have been criticized for a long time for my views on debt. Of course, you always want to work on your relationship with money so you don't have to take on debt that you cannot pay off soon. Of course, you need to be responsible with credit cards. A thousand percent, yes. But debt is also a part of life. And almost everyone I know goes into and out of debt, sometimes multiple, multiple, multiple times in life. And you know what? That's okay in my book. As you probably could tell, Leslie is definitely a powerhouse regarding debt and your rights. She knows so much information and she just really wants to empower you. So Leslie is the person you want if you need somebody on your side to help you work through your debt. You can find out everything about her and her services at TainLawGroup.com. That'll be right in the show notes. Or you can search on any social platform, Leslie Tain, to connect with her. If you enjoyed this episode and you know somebody else who's really struggling with debt, whether it's the emotions or how to pay it off, how to get out of this debt, send this episode to them. As always, you can head to the show notes for all the links to our episode guests, as well as the sponsors who make this show possible. Thank you so much for giving them some love. They definitely are what keeps me coming back week after week, sharing these amazing guests with you. I will see you right back here in a few days for a brand new episode. Get cash for clothes at Plato's Closet in North Charleston and West Ashley. It's so easy. Recycle, earn cash, repeat. We pay cash on the spot for your trendy, gently used clothing, shoes, and accessories. At Plato's Closet, we buy all seasons, all day, every day. It's time to clean out your closet and cash in. Bring in your denim, graphic tees, athletic wear, shoes, handbags, and more. Sell your styles to Plato's Closet for cash. Then do it again. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue.